You know that song? I'll surrender all. Huh? I surrender all. Come on. All to thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. Again. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. Holy Spirit, I ask you in the name of Jesus, today bring our hearts to complete surrender. Bring our minds to the reality of what it means to carry the mind of Christ. Bring our spirits to the place where we are one with you and we're never separated. Bring our eyes to see what no eye has seen and our ears to hear what no ear has heard. God, we open ourselves today so that we can receive the truth of what scripture says we truly are. God, we are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. We are blessed going in and blessed coming out. When our enemies come against us one way, they flee from us seven different ways. We are the body of Christ, the fullness of him that fills all in all. We are sons and daughters. We are not orphans. We are people that are blessed so that we can be a blessing. We are people that are ridiculously blessed, overwhelmingly blessed. We are not people that have a poverty mentality. We are people that have a supernatural, abundant mentality. We are people that live with supernatural abundance. Our cup runneth over, it is not half full or half empty. I am not half empty or half full. I am running over because it's the Lord that fills my cup. I will not be drained. I will not be burnt out. I will burn up for the gospel. You will not read about me burning out. I will burn up. I will never burn out. The ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Can you say that? The ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. The Holy Ghost is in me to make me live as a Holy Ghost, holy filled, holy inspired man of God that doesn't have to bow to the gods of this world because I've bowed my knee to Jesus and I will serve no other God. When the king says, I'm throwing you in the fire, if you don't bow, I will say to the king, what is your fire to me, O king? I will serve God and serve him alone. We will now have no other idols in our life. We will not worship sports. We will not worship news. We will not worship Facebook. We will not worship Instagram. We will worship Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. That's a powerful declaration. Every bit of it was biblical truth. All of it's scripture. It's who God says you are. Doesn't matter what the world says about you. It matters what God says about you. Doesn't matter what your spouse said about you or you said about your spouse. What matters is what God says about you. And if you could hook up, only hook up to what he says, it won't matter what people say. The fear of God will enter your life and the fear of men will exit your life. You'll become living witnesses, witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it won't be just about the crusades you hear about. Your life will become the pulpit for the Lord Jesus Christ to witness through, and you will never live by fear because you will walk by faith, and people of God are people of faith. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Have a seat. Come on. That's for reals. I'm so serious. I've woke up in love with, by the way, I'm getting ready to rock your youth camp. No joke. I'm not kidding. 
Look, your kids aren't coming back the same. I'm talking about full possession. Don't you think it's time that the youth of America have an encounter with the living God? <laughs> Creating Holy Ghost monsters. Ones that are filled with Jesus that totally intimidate their parents. <laughs> I'm really serious. Amen. You guys good? All right. Do I really only have 26 minutes? That's sin. I have a little more freedom here. I mean, in the second service, the first one kind of in and out. I, got, I looked up on the clock, I'm like, I got 13 minutes to explain what I just opened. And it was almost impossible. And I, I think we did pretty well. But all those things that I just said to you, that's my prayer life. Like my prayer life is God, is not God, I need you to do something here because if you don't come and do something, I don't know how I'm gonna make it. My prayer life isn't, God, you know I sowed a, uh, uh, $300 today, and I know that your word says you're gonna give me a hundred times, a hundredfold increase. The reason why I sowed is because I know you're giving me a hundredfold. That is not sowing biblically. Even though scripture says, as you sow, you shall reap. Do you understand that it's different in the kingdom? Look, go to Matthew 6. I'm gonna touch this real quick because I did in the first service. I know, it's so, it's so funny because you can get going really good and then you talk about money and everybody's like. <laughs> I'm serious. Like I'm labeled as a prosperity preacher. I'm like, I, I just need to preach it. Because there's so much biblical truth in scripture about giving. But the reality of it is, is if you can't give, money's God to you. <laughs> if you can't give, Money is Lord in your life. Whenever I start talking like this, people are like, oh dude, he's gonna ask for an offering. I already gave my offering, I don't know. And people shut me off. It's, do you know that God doesn't want you to hold on to any of you? Do you understand that when you came to Jesus, it wasn't some of you and some of him. It wasn't 10% of you and 90% of Jesus. Like can you imagine going to a store and buying a water that said 95% pure? Would you pick that one? No, now I'm going with the smart water, bro, because smart, that's dumb. 95% pure, you're never gonna do that, never. Like, I Surrender All is so powerful when you sing it, you can actually feel and sense the presence of God on it. All to thee, I surrender all, why? Because God has called you to absolutely surrender. When we come to an altar, it's not so that I can just bring him in for a better day so that my life gets better. It's not about my life getting better. Like God didn't come to make bad men good. Come on, are you, are you here? Yeah. He came to make dead people live. But the only way you can truly live is by denying yourself. And the problem is, is we don't deny ourselves, and self is very alive and very prevalent. Here, you know self is alive when you can't even witness the gospel. You can't even share with anybody. What, what, is, the, what is the problem and why can't we? Because self is there. Because we don't have intimacy, we don't have relationship like we confess to. We need relationship and intimacy with Jesus that is so profuse that we can answer people's questions. People come up, well, I got a question. Well, I have an answer. And if I can't, I'm gonna find it in the Bible because the Bible has every answer that you're looking for. Well, I don't think so, not this one. No, you're used to getting all your answers from the world. You can't get your answers from the world if you're a Christian. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fit anymore. You used to be lost, but now you got found. So when I'm looking for an answer from the world, I'm looking for a lost answer. A lost answer doesn't produce hope. It produces hope deferred. <sighs> If I'm looking for psychology to fix me, I'm looking for the way that seems right to a man to fix the way that seems right to a man. And those things are wrong. I'm not saying psychologists are demonic because they're not. But I'm saying there's a difference between you leading the Holy Spirit and you being led by him. 
Bro, a lot of counseling and a lot of things are people that want to make you codependent upon them because you need them to get through life and they're not the ones that are going to get you through life. The counselor is going to get you through life. The comforter is going to get you through life. The friend is going to get you through life. The friend of God. And we all have active resource available. We have the active Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8, 11, that dwells in you and wants to quicken your mortal body. Your brain is part of your mortal body. Do you understand that he wants to quicken this thing so that our mind thinks with the mind of Christ instead of the mind of man? There is a way that seems right to a person. Guys, you woke up today, and if your thoughts aren't yielded and, and geared towards what Scripture said, what's up, big guy? Come on, man. Give me a big hug. Don't break me. It's good to see you again. He wasn't hiding. I saw him. You're doing good. You're doing a lot better. Your whole life has shifted. These last two weeks have been like whirlwind, right? It's only going to get better. If you get scripture inside of your heart and if you see the way God sees, you can't live on the rush of yesterday. Faith doesn't come by reading. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. I'm just going to hone in on you again because I saw you. But you're okay today. It's not as scary. Last time it was scary. Oh my God, he was speaking just to me. But you don't understand, when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to everybody. It's just you're big and you can handle it. I'm taking a risk. The truth is this, our minds have been trained by the world, even when it comes to money. Like, look at this, listen to this. How many of you have Apple TV? Don't lie. Look, five of you, uh uh-uh, it's a setup, don't raise your hand. How many of you drink coffee? Oh, see, see? How many of you drink more than one cup a day? I'm not gonna go any further. How many of you go somewhere to get your coffee sometimes? How many of you go and, how many of you, gosh, how many of you pay money for the things that you do and it's just normal? Am I, am I, am I wrong here? How many of you pay a mortgage? How many of you pay a phone bill? How many of you have cell phones? Wow. How many of you use your cell phone for only the gospel? How many of you have iPads? Come on, how many of you have an iPad? <laughs> I don't know any other thing. Just, it's all I use is Apple, so. Yeah. But how many of you only use your iPad for kingdom purposes? How many of you use your money just to get by in this world and you're using finances to live your life? You can't live life without them, Right? So the way that seems right to a man is survival. I gotta do what I gotta do. Like I said, the American dream. What's the American dream? Get all you can, can all you get, sit on your can. (laughs) It's the American dream. We are grown up with that, that's culture, that's something that we've learned since we were kids. So now we're trying to get everything we can get. We gotta take care of our family. I, I mean, I've got a wife and kids, I gotta take care of my wife and kids. But my priority has to be Jesus in taking care of my wife and kids. God says, in the, in the measure that someone sows, then he shall reap, right? You reap what you sow. How many people have heard that? What if we started our Christian life with this perspective? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus said, unless a seed dies, it abides alone. But if that seed dies, it raises up and abides 36, it goes big, right? So the seed has to die. God sowed his son. Listen to this. God sowed his son so that you could reap life and life abundantly. No, no, no. So it's no longer just about you reap what you sow, it's about you reap what Jesus sowed. It's a completely different way to look at things. When Adam and Eve were cursed in the garden, when they were, they were told by God, you are going to, by the sweat of your brow, they were put into survival mode in the garden. 
And so mankind has been surviving ever since. And it's not wrong to provide for your family. It's not that, it's not that at all. It is wrong when a tithe offering comes along and people say, well, that's Old Testament. I don't believe in that. You look at Hebrews 7 and look at Melchizedek and look at Abraham sowing and you look at Jesus who Melchizedek was a type of Christ and you look at the reality of sowing. When you sow, you shall reap when it comes to finances. But it's the most ridiculous subject and people are labeled prosperity preachers and man, God's just after my money. God's not after your money. God's after your money having you. Because you can only serve one of two masters. You can serve money or you can serve God. You can love the world or you can love God. If you are a lover of the world, you are not a lover of God. 1 John 2, 15. This is real stuff through 17. It's no joke. But we are so accustomed to the way that seems right to a man. And we come to church because we think when we get to church, they're going to, I mean, and God will speak to you at church. It's not about not being spoken to. But the truth is, is that you can't get everything that you need from just a service in the church. You have to get what you need from Jesus himself. He paid a price for you to know that you could approach the throne of grace in time of need. It says in Matthew 6, because I said turn there. It says in Matthew 6, in verse 1, be sure that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Therefore, when you do your charitable deeds, it's not just talking about money only. He's talking about things that you do with a motivation, the motivation behind it, whether it be your giving, whether it be your praying for people, whether it be your leading someone to the Lord, you can lead someone to the Lord to gratify your own ministry needs. You can lead people to the Lord just to make yourself feel important, seem important. Although it's right to lead people to the Lord, it can be done with the wrong motive. Do you know that you can lead 20 million to Christ and it be selfish motives and go to heaven and God look at you and say, away from me. I, I need you to understand, I'm all about winning souls. I, I'm all about people coming to Christ. I need them to come to Christ. But I'm not bringing people to Christ so that they can follow me. Jesus said, when the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It's so important. The motivation of your heart is everything. So it says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. I'm not talking, I'm not saying it's wrong to share testimonies, because we should always share testimonies. We should. It just has to be done from the proper motivation from your heart. Are you with me? I don't know. I feel like there's confusion. I hope to straighten it out. The word will cut through that stuff. He's good. It says this, to be honored by men. Truly I say to you that they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It sounds so crazy. Like if I'm doing a charitable deed and I'm, let's say I'm blessing a waiter. I'm giving that charitable deed with my right hand. How can my left hand not know? My left hand's right here in the vicinity. Are you with me? Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Why, how could your hand cause you to sin something that your heart didn't premeditate first? How could your eye cause you to sin and premeditate something that you aren't already conjuring inside of your mind and inside of your heart to do before you looked with that look? Are you with me? This is a really big deal. So what he's talking about is he's not talking about just sharing a testimony or sharing what you did because we should all have, every one of you should have testimonies in here. It doesn't matter who you are. Every one of you has the ability to sow seed. I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about seeds, your words. Watch, 1 Peter 3.15 says, when someone asks you about the hope that is in you, be ready to give an account for why it's there. When's the last time someone asked you about the hope that was in you to give you the chance to share what it is? That's conviction, that's not condemnation. Do we all, yes or no, do we all have the ability to share a faith? Do we all share a faith? Why? 
Yeah. I want to say selfish, but it's not to look at people and bang them and bash them because it's not about that. Because I don't believe that you're so selfish that you don't want to share your faith. I don't believe your mo- I don't believe your motivation. I don't believe your motivation is not to share your faith. I don't believe that. I, I believe that if you could, you would. How many agree that if you could and it and it was inspired by God, would you share your faith? No, no, no. I'm I'm asking you a real question. This isn't a setup. If you felt inspired and compelled by the Holy Spirit to share your faith, would you? That means you're not bad people that want to selfishly hold back the gospel, but something has to shift and something has to change in order for you to be free to share your faith. How many of you, this is the harder question, how many of you would actually like to tithe 10% off the top of your income? Look at that. I got like 12 people. You sinners. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Why can't we? Why can't we do that? I'm not taking an offering. I just want you to know. This isn't a setup. I want your life to be an offering. I'm not setting you up for offering. I'm not, Russ, tell them. I'm not taking an offering. (laughs) I want you to hear this. You got to hear this. Why can't we tithe? Why can't we give offerings if the Lord says to do so? Because of fear. Exactly. Thank you, somebody that's not afraid to say it. Are you with me? Fear. What's the fear? Not having enough. What's the fear? Like, I'm giving away 10%. I need pretty much 100% of what I'm taking in in order to make it. What's the fear? God's not my provider. I am. Is that wrong to say? Are we okay if truth comes? Or do you guys want to like sugarcoat this thing? Because sugar's from hell. It is. You look up refined sugar and tell me if there's anything godly in it. Why can't we give it? Fear. Why? We don't believe. Is that wrong to say? No, somebody should say it. Like, why can't I give an offering? Fear. I'm not going to have enough. I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. I got to live this much. I'm living tight. I'm living this. I can't. When's the last time we trusted God and said, you know what, God? You're my provider and my job is not. It's completely contrary to everything you've grown up with. It's contrary. Got to save. Got to put my kids in college. Putting away money. Making sure I can do this. What happens if our economy collapses? Where's the church at if the economy collapses? What are we doing? If our whole government system of money is completely cut off, how would you live? Would you function? I don't think we would do very well. Gosh. Oh, this is, this is gonna be great. How important How important is eternity to you? Already leading people to Christ, buddy. Good job. Just saved and leading people to Jesus already. So proud of you, man. Good job. How important is eternity to you? All right. I had a couple people that think it's important. How important is it for you to bring people with you when you go? How important is it for all of your colleagues that are at your work to go to heaven? If it's not important, you're in sin and unforgiveness. How important is you to see heaven full and hell empty? How important is it for you to run your race with diligence? Do you know that God says he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him? So if God's not showing up in your life, it's because you're not diligently seeking him. That's not antichrist. That's the truth of biblical truth. What does, G, what does God say about prayer? He talks about, he talks about money and he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But what does survival do? Lays up for ourselves treasures on earth trusting in the world system in order to keep our money safe, to multiply it with investments. And I'm not saying it's not, it's not, 
I'm not saying it's wrong to invest. I'm not saying it's wrong, it's wrong to do that and to make money. People do it really well. But the problem is, is none of that stuff goes with you. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, thieves can't break in and steal, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So the proof of where our heart is is where we're laying up treasures. This never goes over well. That's why I'm glad I get to preach it. If I'm only laying up treasures here to keep myself safe and to make sure that everything's good here, I'm not laying up for myself treasures here. How can I absolutely lay up treasures in heaven? How can I do that? It says the eye of the body, the lamp, or the eye is the lamp of the body. Right after that section. The eye is the lamp of the body, meaning your perspective while you're here is everything. If you're not eternally focused and if you're not kingdom minded, if you're not Christ centered and Christ minded, you will be carnally minded and you will behave as mere men. I have to be heavenly minded so that I can be earthly incredible. I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm a flake on this earth and I have nowhere to fit. I, I want to be on my job. I, I want to do my job as unto the Lord and not for people. But I want to be so heavenly minded that when I'm there, I am witnessing and sharing my heart and sharing my faith, seeing people saved, healed, delivered, protected, made whole, kept safe and sound. I want to see people sozo everywhere I go. I want to see it happen. I need to see people come to Jesus. But can I let my job slack when I'm doing it? No way. I am there to absolutely do a great job for my employer, all glorifying Jesus at the same time people are like well I can't do that at my job no fear is stopping you I don't want to hear it I've done it I did it I proved you wrong people are like you're gonna get fired okay so what but I'm gonna do the best job ever so they're gonna have a hard time firing me why because my work ethic is absolutely incredible I'm doing a better job than the people around me the only thing they can convict me of is miracles happen everywhere I go salvations are happening and they're losing people to a God that they can't see but my mind is fixed and focused on the things of heaven and not the things of man I can't afford to think like that because if I'm not thinking like that I'm thinking worldly and you can't love the world and love God both you can't love God and love money both. You can either love one and you can, listen, one of them is gonna dominate you. And he's talking about the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. The single eye actually, it means one voyage, one perspective. My perspective is gonna be so heavenly minded that I'm earthly incredible. Colossians 3 says, set your mind on things above and not things beneath. It says that I'm supposed to think like God thinks. That's crazy. How can I think with the mind of God? It's easy. First Corinthians chapter 2 says that the Holy Spirit reveals the deep things of God to the spirit that's in you, the depth of man. Those two commune and collaborate. So what happens is the spirit of God and my spirit collaborate. My mind is there, but my heart gets filled with the truth of what God's word says, so that I can start to think from a different perspective. I'm not thinking lost, I'm thinking found. I'm not thinking blind, I'm thinking see. My perspective is single focused, it's gospel focused, it's eternity focused. What does that mean when it comes to finances? What if you knew that one dollar could produce one soul? What if you knew that? I don't think a hundred dollars would be hard for you to part with. What if you knew there was an absolute guarantee that when you sowed your dollar, it was going to produce one soul in heaven. What if you knew that? What if you knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt because it's been proven that that's the facts? That's what CFAN does. That's the church that you're in. That's the ministry that you're a part of. You don't know it, but I do know it. That's the statistics, it's real. So if you knew that, guaranteed regardless, what is your treasure in heaven if you were to sow into that perspective knowing that one soul is one dollar and every week, even though you couldn't go, your dollar could and a soul gets saved. 
What could you do with that? Why would you not want to be a part of that? Why? Because money is our God and God is not. I'm not saying this for an offering. I'm saying this so your life can soon become one. Guys, you don't have to live in fear. You can live in faith. Do you know it says this? It says that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. Then it goes into the largest chapter on worry in the Bible. It says, don't worry about the birds. Don't worry about this. The birds don't worry. They neither provide for them themselves. Yet your heavenly father provides for each one of these of how much more value are you than they. God talks about the value system of he- in heaven. I'm sorry if you're a birdologist, but the truth is, <laughs> is that you have way more value than any animal on the planet. There are people that have ministry to animals because they can't stand people. They're done being hurt by people, and cats and dogs don't talk back. I'm not saying don't love your animals, you're supposed to, but if you can't love people, it's because you've been hurt by people and you can't. There's so many people that are sewing into so many different things, animal projects, like save the animals, save this, like horses, all the stuff, and I'm not against that stuff. But if that has priority over sowing into soul saving and soul winning, something is wrong in your theology. Something is really wrong and that's not okay. God doesn't want you to live that way. God wants you to be fruitful and multiply. He wants you to raise up soul winners that are actually fruitful and multiply. This is a big deal. You know, when he talks about prayer in Matthew 6, prayer. He says, when you pray, don't pray out there where everybody can look at you and say, wow, you're a great prayer. Because if you're praying so that people can see you pray, you've received your reward. He actually says fasting, the same thing. Sowing, praying, and fasting. When you fast, don't look like you're fasting. Put oil on your head. Like, like look like you're not fasting. Don't tell people, oh, brother, I'm 20 days in this fast, man. Praise God, I'm doing good. You have your reward in full because you received it from the praise of man. When you sow and you tell people about your sowing, well I gave this and this and this, and and a lot of times it's not even for kingdom's sake, it's just to show people what you did, but you have your reward in full. And then it says when you fast, Like, don't tell everybody you're fasting just to get the praise of man. No, your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Come on, when you pray, he says, go into your closet. You know where my closet is? It could be right here in front of you. It is. While I'm standing here with you, I am rejoicing always. I am praying without ceasing. And I am in everything giving thanks. While I'm preaching to you, while I'm sharing my heart with you, I'm rejoicing because one of you is gonna get this. I'm rejoicing, I'm praying without ceasing, why? I'm always praying in my heart, in my head, I'm always praying. Even when I'm talking, I'm praying. That seems contradictory because we think it has to be, oh Lord! (laughs) Every time I grocery shop, Every time, everywhere I go, I'm constantly praying. Why? Nothing has, the, nothing has the opportunity to overturn my prayer life because nothing is more important than the price that he paid. Nothing. Nothing. I can't afford to let this world system, this world, the things that you're seeing, the culture that's twisted, I can't afford to ever sacrifice truth on an altar of being culturally relevant. But if I don't know truth, I've already sacrificed truth. The reason why we don't pray is because we don't know Him. There's no reason why you wouldn't pray Unless, of course, you don't know him enough to talk to him. Can there be another reason? Could there be another reason? If if something so valuable, Jesus said to be an imitator of God. You can't imitate somebody that you don't know. 
If Jesus said you can be an imitator of God, if he said you can be renewed in the spirit of your mind, if you cannot be conformed to this world, what does that mean? That means that I am going to come out from the world. I'm not going to be conformed to this world. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that everywhere I go, I can be the active proof of God's will. I can prove God's will in everything that I do, in every person I talk to. That's what God wants from me. He wants complete surrender. He wants me to be obedient in my finances. He wants me to be obedient in my prayer life. He wants me to be obedient in my fasting life. And he says the only way that any of them work was to pull away and to actually seek him when no one's looking. But the key to everything is righteousness. Because if you don't see that you've been made right with God, you don't think. Because the Christian life is this. I simply have 24-7 access to the King of glory. Listen. <laughs> the Christian life. I have 24-7 access and an audience with the King. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he loves me. He never changes his love for me. He doesn't change his mind for me. Life gets in the way of that. That's why he says you can't love God and love the world. Because if you're pursuing your career more than you're pursuing truth, you are a lover of the world and you must repent. Doesn't matter who you think you are, how much of a business person you are, how much of a student you are, how much of a housewife with five kids you think you are. If you're pursuing anything above the pursuit of Him, the world has you. God is a jealous God. And he's given you the Holy Spirit inside of you. Every born again believer has the Holy Spirit come and live in them. But when that Holy Spirit comes to live in you, in the beginning of your Christian life, when it's like the whole new world and everything has changed and the burdens off and all that stuff happens, what he's wanting to, you, wanting to do to you is he wants you to be so attracted to him. And in the beginning of your Christian life, you can sense the Holy Spirit yearning jealously he is in you yearning jealously for full affection, full attention, and everything that you are. And we've forsaken that for the world and seared our conscience. I love you, but this is real truth, guys. This is not, oh, you're bad people. You're not bad people. You're God's people. You're God's people, but Satan is the God of this world, the prince and power of this air that you breathe. Satan is the power and principalities. Your war is not against flesh and blood. It is a principality war. You have the demonic that is gunning to take your mind and your heart and to have it more yielded to the world than it is yielded to the Father. And the only way for us to actually come back to the sincere yearning of the Holy Ghost is to admit where we are. <laughs> oh, I can, I, can, I can feel his heartbeat for you guys. He loves us so much. He wants to awaken our hearts. He wants to awaken our souls. He wants to clean you. He wants to wash your conscience clean by the active blood of Jesus that never coagulates. That's on a throne called mercy. He wants to apply that merciful blood to your conscience so that you can cut off your relationship with the world. So that you can actually, this is the only where, this is the only place that divorce isn't an option. You must divorce yourself from the world and you must join into union with Christ or you cannot live the Christian life. You must, you must cut ties with the world that has been your Lord. 
It's no joke, this is real. And as soon as I came into the room, I, I felt worship today. And there was such freedom in what was happening on that stage today. And I talked about it in first service because there wasn't that freedom. I said to Russ, it's here. It's here. It happened. That freedom that happened right there needs to be your 24 hours a day, seven, seven days a week freedom. Not just right now. I'm talking about that life, that Christian life that Jesus paid a price to say, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He didn't say just for worship at Nations Church at 11 a.m. on Sundays. The freedom that you can have is cutting ties with the world. Is saying, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want my money to be my Lord. I want Jesus to be my Lord, not just my Savior. He didn't just pay a price to get me to heaven. He paid a price to get hell out of me. And I don't want to live my life governed by hell anymore. I don't want to live my life governed by the stock market. I don't want to live my life governed by business. I don't want to live my life in survival mode. I want to know that God is my provider and I actually want to test him because the Bible says, test me and see. When you sow, you re God rebukes the devourer off of your life. He rebukes the devourer. You have no ability to rebuke the devourer. But I'm asking you right now, church, I love coming here. If I move, if I lived here, I would go here. This would be my place. This would be my house. No joke. But my question is this. Does the world have you or does God have you? Are you more submitted and surrendered to the world or are you more surrendered to God? Are you more surrendered to the world or are you more surrendered to God? Who do you want to be Lord? Because if the world is Lord, you are headed for demise. Your hope is deferred and that's why your heart's sick. But if Jesus is Lord and you're submitted to him and he's actually the king and Lord of your life, you will realize that you're royalty and you will realize that you're a holy nation set apart. A holy people that God gave the Holy Ghost to so that we could destroy hell for a living instead of living and being governed by it. So my question to you is where are you church? Where are you? Where's your heart? Where's your surrender at? Is it to Jesus? Because if it's not, you better get it right. Because I'm telling you, if you think we're facing hard times now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Real persecution hasn't hit the church, but it's going to. And if you're not surrendered, you will be taken out. It says that in the end, it says if God didn't cut it short, let me just pour it out for you. If God didn't cut it short, even the elect would have trouble. That doesn't mean it's getting better. There's all kinds of doctrines out there. I'm sorry, it's going to get worse. But a rise and shine. Your light has come. You are the light of the world. And you got to forsake the world. You got to turn your back and divorce your work. Divorce your stuff that's in this world. And give your heart to Jesus. So my question, church, is where are you at today? I didn't come here to entertain you. I came here to preach the original gospel, the one that we all say we know. My question is, how well do you know Jesus and how much do you want to know him? Is your time governed by work and schedule and stuff and you just try to make that little squeeze for God and you think you're okay with your devotion? Because your devotion isn't enough. He's talking about all day, every day, being in that place of prayer, being in that place of surrender, saying, God, here's my life. Use it for what you want. Use me. There's no question that the world is filled with confusion, terror, division, moral decline, desperation, fear, you name it. Darkness has never seemed so thick. But we believe there has never been a generation more ready for change, for hope, for truth, for real love. We love because Jesus first loved us. We are not a hopeless generation. The time is now to live the impossible and love like Jesus. Jesus in us will shape the culture around us. Jesus in us will transform nations.
Wherever you are, you can be the change you want to see. You can live the lifestyle Jesus paid for on the cross right now. Be transformed by love and equipped in community to boldly bring kingdom transformation to your city, your workplace, your school, your home. The change starts with you.